welcome to Fixing Bugs in Democracy. This is a new series co-sponsored by the Princeton Gerrymandering Project and the Pace Center for Civic Engagement. Uh, both of those are entities here at Princeton University. Uh, I am one of your hosts. My name is Sam Wong and I'm a professor of neuroscience and director of the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. Uh, tonight, uh, we are also doing an episode of Politics and Polls. That's the podcast of Princeton University and the Woodrow Wilson School. And uh, as I said, I'm one host, Sam Wong, and uh, my co-host right here uh, in the corner is Julian Zelizer. Excited to be part of this again and excited for tonight's conversation. Yeah, it's, uh, it's our new experiment in uh, the tentacles of media where we do like, you know, live video on Zoom and YouTube and everything. Um, so let's see. So our guest tonight is Dave Daly. And Dave Daly is a veteran journalist uh, who is known for many things. He's had a pretty long career as a journalist, editor. Uh, I'm going to say right before I forget that at one point, I believe he wrote the liner notes for an REM album. Uh, oh, wow. So, yeah, this is like, you know, there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on here. Um, and so uh, he, um, he's uh, in the political domain, our domain tonight. He's best known for his book, um, I, I, I just can't, I'm such a blue nose, Rat Eft. I can't do it. Uh, Rat Eft, the true story behind the secret plan to steal America's democracy and the movement that inspired to reform redistricting uh, nationwide. Uh, I personally, as someone who works on redistricting and gerrymandering, uh, I consider Dave's reportage to be the indispensable resource. He's got a new book out and we're gonna be talking about that and about what went into reporting it. His new book is Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy. That's the sequel to uh, the first book. And it's a book on how citizens are rising up to restore and strengthen democracy. Um, I would personally regard Dave as the uh, Hunter S. Thompson of democracy reform, which uh, is a phrase that I never thought I would say until meeting Dave. Uh, he's a longtime friend and inspiration to the Princeton Gerrymandering Project. Uh, he spent a lot of time um, on the road reporting unrigged in uh, red states like Idaho, Utah, and North Dakota, purple states like Michigan and Pennsylvania. Uh, so Dave Daly, thank you for coming on with us tonight. Such a pleasure. Hi, Sam. Hi, Julian. Yeah. Well, let's... Uh, Let's get into it. So let's see. So you, um, your background is uh, in newspaper editing, and you are a reporter and editor at the Hartford Courant. And then you somehow fell into this, uh, what I think must have seemed like a niche subject at the time, gerrymandering. So I want to hear about that transition from general news, I guess as the Courant, also Salon Magazine, how you went from that into this topic that has kind of blown up on activists. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, thank you, um, and hello, everybody. Um, I never imagined uh, that I would be called the Hunter S. Thompson of gerrymandering, and, uh, or that anybody would be called the Hunter S. Thompson of gerrymandering. Um, I came to this, I think, Sam, in a really similar way that you did. Um, I got up one day and asked a really simple question, which was, why didn't Democrats take back the House in 2012 when Obama's reelected, when Democrats hold on to the Senate? Um, I, I didn't, I was the editor-in-chief of Salon. I was, I was running our politics coverage. Um, so it's folks like Steve Kornacki and Joan Walsh. And, you know, we, we were running a brilliant people every day um, and sort of working with them. And what we were covering every day out of the U.S. House were... 50 different votes to repeal Obamacare, most of which seemed like they were absolute stunts. We were covering, you know, government shutdowns. Um, I grew up in Connecticut um, and I was not naive about gun control, but I thought that after kindergartners and first graders were massacred at Sandy Hook, that there might be a chance for a national conversation about this. And none of it happened. Um, and so I simply asked that question, what happened in 2012? And when I went back and looked, I said, wait a second, how does Pennsylvania, uh, a state that at that point in time had elected, uh, had given its electoral uh, college votes to a Democrat every year since 1988, um, have 13 Republicans and five Democrats? How does Ohio send 12 Republicans, four Democrats. I'd gone to grad school in North Carolina. It's a purple state, but it was not a 10 Republican, three Democrat state. Um, you know, Michigan was nine, five. And I kind of said, what happened here? Um, and I came across Red Map. And 
this was the redistricting majority project. It was a, a project of the Republican State Leadership Committee. Uh, and it was in many ways their response to the 2008 election that um, uh, first elected Obama and kind of gave Democrats a super majority in, in Washington and led to all this talk about how the Democratic Party would be a majority party in the nation for a generation to come. And Republicans um, had a path back to power and it was through state legislatures. And that was what a red map was. And they enacted that in 2010. Uh, and we can talk about it. But the effect of that was that those state legislatures had drawn these lines in 2012 that had helped to hold back a democratic wave. And it wasn't me saying this. I stumbled across, just in researching this, a, a primitive looking web page for RedMap in which the Republican operatives were taking credit for what they had done. And again, I was running Salon. I was, you know, I was editing Joan and Steve and all of these people uh, every day. And this was not something anybody was talking about. And I thought, well, there's a story here. And you, um, and the way you painted is that uh, is that Democrats were caught unawares. I mean, let's see, Obama had run, won a reasonably big and convincing electoral victory by modern standards in 2008. And then along comes redistricting in 2010. By the way, we're coming up on another redistricting cycle at the end of this year. So the maps get redrawn. Um, so you make it, uh, I, you've made it seem as if the Democrats were kind of uh, caught with their pants down, but surely they had an interest in drawing maps to their advantage. So what was different? Another great question. Um, and in the new book, I spend a lot of time with Eric Holder, uh, who was Obama's attorney general at the time and was, um, is currently running the Democrats redistricting the gerrymandering arm. Um, and what Holder said to me is that two weeks after the 2012 election, he and Obama are in the White House and they're looking at the numbers and they can't figure out what happened. They're like, we thought we had a really good night. What happened to us in North Carolina? What happened to us in Ohio? Wait, so he didn't know until after the 2012 election? They didn't understand what had happened to them. And that's insane. So like, I didn't know, but that's just because I'm a goober and I like, and I wasn't paying attention. Barack but Obama these are, these are people and the party. Holder didn't know. They hadn't heard of RedMap. They didn't know what had gone on. They knew that 2010 was a redistricting year on some level, but I mean, I think what's important to understand here, and I think that the, this is why the story got lost in some ways, and I think this is why it was easy for Republicans to sort of get away with it. Gerrymandering has been with us for as long as we've had politicians, right? I mean, you can trace it back to uh, Patrick Henry trying to keep James Madison out of the, the, the very first Congress. It, you know, it gets its name from a poor Elbridge Gary in 1812, drawing those uh, state Senate uh, districts around, um, around Boston in such a way as to uh, try to keep the, the Federalists out of the, uh, the chamber. Um, and it's been with us forever, and both sides had done it. But gerrymandering from 1790 through 2000 is almost the minor leagues of gerrymandering. And what happens in 2010 is it sort of catapults itself straight into its steroids era. Um, and it's, it's that the Republican strategy to go after state legislatures is so specific and sophisticated, but it also matches up with the year in which the technology uh, becomes so precise, the computer software becomes so exacting, and the data on so many Americans is suddenly available to go up and down these streets. We're so polarized and you're able to draw these lines in such a way that map makers had not been able to in the past. And I talked to a lot of these people who talk about how even in 1990 and 2000, the computers were so slow that they were not able to do more than three or four versions of these maps. In 2010, these guys in Wisconsin are able to do 50, 60, 70 draft maps each one becoming ever more perfect. My guys can do a billion in a day. Yeah, and that's the difference between 2010 and 2020, and that's why we ought to be really careful about what we're getting into next year. 
I just jump in? So I, I love to refer to your book when I give talks all the time, when I talk about polarization and uh, different ways that it works. So the major change, though, people always say gerrymandering is always around. In California, Democrats were notorious with the Burtons uh, for doing this with precision. So the major change for you is the technology. Uh, that's what makes 2010 to today different than everything came, that came before? I would say that is 95% of it, is that the technology, you know, I mean, Phil Burton's drawing these maps on a napkin at a bar. Mm -hmm. um, these right, guys- that's the, 19, that's the 1980s cycle. Yes, I mean, Phil Burton in California is a democratic politician who is a master of this, and he refers to his districts as his contributions to modern art. Um, but in a way, I would also say this, I would say that, I would say that gerrymandering in previous decades had almost been more of an incumbent protection game um, run, by, uh, run by both sides, and in 2010, it moves into a seat maximization game. Uh, I mean, in 2000, in Florida, you have Karl Rove and Nancy Pelosi essentially striking a deal with each other to uh, uh, carve up California's districts in such a way that uh, both sides get the but number this, of seats. At this, the this gets back to the precision thing, where if you can make your win 55% or 57% or 70%, you can get beyond single seat protection and just and exactly. make your team bigger, just have more wins for your guys. And I think in the way that uh, gerrymandering had often been thought about was people said, well, if, 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 if these districts move closer towards 54, 55, 56, then they're vulnerable in a wave. And I think what's different about our politics right now is that a 54, 55, 56 district with this level of polarization and that level of specificity in the, in the data is not as vulnerable a seat as it used to be. Um, you know, I mean, I talked to, um, well, he's, I won't mention his, his name, although I think I quote him in the book, um, but um, that you could draw a 5149 district now that looks super competitive, but in reality, it wouldn't be competitive at all because of the levels of polarization and the, um, and the data and technology that you can use to draw these lines. And then the, this is a question I, I remember when I read your first book, uh, whatever we're calling it uh, on the show, I will follow Sam's rules. Um, what's striking is what you said to Sam, that the Democrats didn't see this, that here's this massive operation on an element of politics that is familiar uh, and knowable, and you paint this Democratic Party that kind of missed the boat. Your new book is really interesting, and it's almost like the party or, or activists are awake, unrigged, awakening to this as a political issue. But the question I always, I don't have an answer to, and it, and it relates to other elements of politics, like kind of the way you use the filibuster. Why are Republicans so ahead on things like gerrymandering and redistricting? And why are Democrats so far behind when they obviously have sophisticated advisors and consultants? Why does the party miss this? Why did they miss it in 2010? Republicans were more desperate. Um, I think if you think about it this way, this is the story of two elections. 2008, you get the nation's first black president. You have a Democratic supermajority in the U.S. Senate uh, and a big renewed majority in the House. And um, if you go back and you uh, look at the cable news coverage that night or look at the newspapers from the next day, people from both sides were talking about how the Democratic Party was going to ride this kind of demographic change to become a majority party in the nation for another generation. Uh, and it doesn't exactly turn out that way, does it? Um, and it's because Republicans needed to try to figure out a way around that demographic challenge. And what they hit on was the awareness that 2010 is a redistricting year. Um, and I think that in some ways, both parties in the past had thought about redistricting as you get yours, I'll get mine. And what Republicans realized was, was that it didn't have to be that way. They reinvented the, the oldest political trick in the book that year. And they did so out of political necessity. 
um, and it was a lot easier. You know, I mean, in I mean, after Romney's loss in 2012, you get the big Republican autopsy, and what they say is we've stopped talking to you know, black voters and Hispanic voters and young voters. We've got to find a new way of reaching out to these people. Um, if they had hit on that strategy after 2008, maybe the nation's politics look very different for the last decade. Uh, instead, the strategy was uh, to try to redistrict these states and to hold back those demographic trends. Um, in the book, I talk with Chris Jankowski, who was the Republican mastermind behind this plan. And what he, he says um, is that they thought they could buy themselves a decade. I think they thought that if they drew these lines, they could hold back the demographic waves for a few years while the party then worked to increase its appeal amongst women and young voters and minorities. And he talks about some of the other programs he was launching in 2010, 2011, that would have tried to have done some of that outreach. What backfired on them, I think, and what created the kind of Frankenstein's monster that many of them were not expecting is that drawing districts in, in this way, in this polarized era, put the base in charge in such a way as to make that kind of outreach that they would have liked to have done impossible. Uh, right, the fundamental, yeah, the fundamental um, offense in some sense is not giving more seats to one party or the other, although that's obviously a distortion. There's this uh, offense underlying that, which is to make representatives unresponsive to their voters, where they don't have to answer to voters. I would characterize um, what you're saying as part of this uh, large demographic picture in which uh, as a party of nationalists, as a party of anti-immigrant uh, and, and, and largely white and non-college voters, that's a base that's getting smaller and smaller. And as the rise, waters are rising up, it takes more and more extreme measures to make sure you keep your head above water. And so I would regard the whole thing as a, a rear guard action to take whatever your way of life was for 50 years and to take your, your shrinking base and just do whatever you can, like Mark Tushnet calls it, uh, constitutional hardball, playing hardball within the rules of the game, doing whatever it takes to keep your head above water. And so uh, at some level, uh, from a tech point of view, it's sort of, um, it's sweet and clever and uh, a really interesting way to, to like, you know, to fiddle with the knobs of democracy and to find a way to squeeze out just a few seats. So in some sense, uh, as a tech nerd, I, I'm, I'm in some admiration of the craftsmanship. I think that's what happened. I think they, they, they recognized that their base was shrinking and it was in specific places and they hit upon a way to ensure that that base could still produce big majorities uh, simply by drawing lines in really, really clever ways. Um, but it's had ripple effects and consequences for a generation. Democrats missed it. Republicans didn't hide what they were doing. Um, I mean, Karl Rove lays it out in an op-ed in March 2010 in the Wall Street Journal. And I mean, I recommend- about as public as it gets. Uh, it, it is if you, you got your newspaper that day, you know? I mean, Rove lays out the whole plan. He says, this is what we're gonna do. This is what the effects will be for a generation. And this is where we're gonna do it. And he lays out the specific small towns in, in Texas and Pennsylvania where they're gonna go. Uh, that the Democrats miss this is um, political incompetence of the highest order, and it has had long-lasting consequences. We're here with Dave Daly, who's an uh, uh, expert on democracy reform, and uh, we've been talking so far about redistricting in his first book, um, Rat Apt. Uh, and so I just wanted to interject here that uh, we're now going to get to the new book, but I wanted to interject here that if anybody wants to ask questions uh, in the live version of this um, uh, event, you can tweet using the hashtag fixing bugs in democracy. So you do hashtag, sorry, pound sign fixing bugs in democracy. That's one way to ask questions. If you're following us on Zoom, you can do it on the q and I already see a few questions there, which we'll get to. Uh, this is good, you can, got some questions. Uh, or you can text us um, at 929-242 9349. That's 
9349. So Twitter, Zoom, and text message, all ways to ask us questions. In about 10, 15 minutes, we'll, we'll go to some of those questions. Dave, I wonder if we could now go to your book, your current book, your new book, Unrigged, and talk about uh, something I think that seems more hopeful. Yes, oh, we, have, we, we all have to do this, right? Okay, so yes, there's the book. Uh, Julian's is a PDF, I think, and so yeah, yes, yeah, so you can so you can hold up your no, but you're using your laptop, so you can't hold up the PDF. Here it is. Um, Take the screen. So, so let's talk about the new book, Unrigged, uh, where you followed up um, your first book, where you chronicled the depredations, all these things that are, are done to distort democracy. Um, your new book, Unrigged, is more hopeful, it seems, and you traveled all across the country. You met grassroots organizers. Tell us a little bit about, uh, I don't know, how many miles you traveled and exactly what you're trying to do there. Um, what a blast it was, let me tell you. I mean, I started to feel like I had a dark rain cloud over my head as I was talking about gerrymandering and everything and all the degradations of democracy. And I didn't, I'd be giving these talks to wonderful groups after 2016 that were trying to get active and involved. And sometimes I feel like, oh, I just sucked all the air out of that room. All right. Um, and I needed for my own sake, for the sake of um, trying to give people some hope and some optimism, I wanted to tell stories about the fight back. Um, and as I looked around the country, you started to see them. Uh, you had Katie Fahey on last week. I mean, Katie Fahey's story is remarkable, you know, 27 years old and running a recycling nonprofit in, um, in Grand Rapids. And, you know, two days after the election goes on Facebook and says, I want to start uh, doing something about gerrymandering in Michigan. And it starts a revolution there, you know, a Facebook post. Um, and she's not the only one. Um, there were these amazing examples of citizens that sort of stood up and pushed back against these big structural inequities that all the experts thought were way too hard to do something about. Uh, and people, whether out of not knowing how hard they'd be to take on uh, or just determination to grab their democracy back, um, took hold and started doing the work and it was everyday citizens. Um, but these are in states where they, they can get something on the ballot. So there's uh, Michigan, lots of, Colorado. Uh, there's lots of different Utah. stories here. Uh, and it was amazing for me. I mean, um, you know, those were a dark and complicated uh, times in our politics. And um, so to go out and be able to travel around the country with these groups that sort of logged off of Twitter and turned off cable news and and got to work was just absolutely inspiring. Um, I mean, so out in Idaho, um, I joined this amazing organization called Reclaim Idaho um, that was working to um, expand Medicaid um, in, you know, a red state is, you know, ruby red is Taylor Swift's lipstick, right? I mean, it's a one party state and they buy an RV and they just start driving it around the state, collecting signatures um, and talking to their neighbors. Um, and, you, and you wrote in that RV, did you do that? I did, I went out to Idaho and spent a few days with them and it was, abs you know, we slept in the, I in the RV and I it, in, the in America Falls and it was unbelievable. You go out and you knock on doors. I mean, my favorite door, I think we walk up this driveway uh, in in Idaho Falls, and there's a bumper sticker on the car that says Vietnam. We were winning when I left, and, and I'm thinking, you know, how about if we go to the house over there? This guy was winning the war in Vietnam, um, and we go up and knock on his door, and they're they're fearless, and they just start the conversation. They just start the process of political persuasion. About Medicaid, like they're just, they're, they're just chatting with him. he's like, oh Medicaid. yeah, my mom falls into that gap, fell into that gap, I know it well. Um, and, you know, I'll sign that and I'll vote for it. And they won in Idaho with more than 60% of the vote. You know, I mean, down in Florida, I went down and, you know, spent time with Desmond Mead 
who runs this amazing mighty moral coalition that unites left and right, black and white, churchgoers and, and former convicts. And they win a constitutional amendment in Florida uh, that wins it over 64% of the vote to r restore voting rights to former felons there, 1.4 million people. Um, and there's these stories so, around so the nation. So these are not gerrymandering stories. This is all kinds of democracy reform. This is now Medicaid expansion. This is now getting voting, voting rights back for one and a half million Floridians. So you, you covered a lot of stories. Yeah, um, I was out, out in Florida talking, you know, I'm sorry, so I, I was down in Florida, you know, I was in, in Utah and, and cover the, 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 the events in North Dakota on Native American voting rights went around the country on, on student voting rights. The passion that was unleashed in this country that I think we saw, especially in the 2018 election, was this citizen movement that was nonpartisan. It was uniting Democrats, Republicans, independents. You don't win Medicaid expansion in Idaho with 60% of the vote if you're counting on Democrats. I think Democrats are about 14% of the vote in Idaho. You can't win a constitutional amendment in Florida on, on felon voting rights at 64% of the vote in a year in which Ron DeSantis and Rick Scott are elected st statewide, unless if you are doing the work of persuading people who maybe aren't automatically on your side. So, I went out looking for hope and optimism in, in our politics, and I found it in these really unlikely places, people doing the hard work of rebuilding these, uh, these structural uh, problems that had gotten bugs put in them. Can you talk a little more? I'm curious what you found in terms of what motivates these people. And I mean, uh, A, one of the things that's interesting about your books is you find ways to make this interest, interesting and accessible and you kind of unpack why gerrymandering or uh, different parts of our electoral system are in fact incredibly relevant to the way politics works. Last week um, with Fahey we discussed a little that back in the 60s the one man one vote issue was another time this became relevant, but it was tied to the civil rights struggle very clearly. In all the different people you traveled with and, and encountered, what's motivating them to get out of their house and, and to talk about structural reform as opposed to other kinds of high profile issues? It's a great question, but, um, and I think it goes back to something that struck me working on the first book too, um, structural, I think that there's more awareness among regular Americans than folks imagine about the connection between structural reform and the broken dysfunction of our politics. Um, and, and Congressman Sarbanes said this uh, to me when we were talking about HR1, which he helped write. He said that Democrats in 2016, 2018 would be out having town halls and they'd be giving these their, their, their presentations and they could feel that the room wasn't with them when they talked about how they were gonna fix healthcare and increase the minimum wage and all of these you know, litany of policy proposals. Uh, and in the questions, it came out that people didn't think that it could get done because of the brokenness and the gridlock and gerrymandering and, and, and sort of all of these structural problems. And he said, once they started talking about the structural problems, the room started nodding along, people started bobbing their heads and they, they realized, um, okay, people sort of get this in a really profound way. Um, 59 million Americans right now live in a state in which one or both chambers of their state legislature is controlled by the party that won fewer votes mm -hmm. in 2018. That's one in five of us. Um, so if you live in Michigan, if you live in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Wisconsin um, you understand the impact of gerrymandering firsthand. You've lived with it for the last a decade. 
you've seen how it drives policy to the extremes. Uh, you've seen how it means that your votes don't count the way that they perhaps used to. You don't have competitive elections all the way down to your state legislature. Um, and I think people have sort of come to really understand that this is a huge problem and that it was incumbent on them to do something about it. The courts slammed the door. Um, and the politicians were not going to fix the process that kept them in office. It was up to the people to do this. And it was up to them to, to fix gerrymandering, but it was also up to them to expand Medicaid in Idaho because the legislature there had refused to do it six years in a row. If people wanted to get anything done, they had no choice but to take it into their own hands. Now, the, in, in your other book, um, the heart of it is the national party investing in these efforts, going into Pennsylvania and pouring money into a very small seat that seemed irrelevant. In this case, it's more about citizen activism. Is there top-down support uh, in the stories you saw from, from either funders or from the Democratic Party, or are they a kind of operating on their own, once again, disconnected from a party that's, that's not seen this as central? I think, I think it started on its own, and I think that some funding has flown into it since then. Um, I, mean, if, I mean, if you look at you know, Katie Fahey and what happened in Michigan, uh, there was, I think, a lot of reluctance to fund them at all because people thought that Michigan was where good ideas went to die, and it was such an expensive state to try to operate in. Uh, I don't think they had a lot of support until they got on the ballot and then until the, the, the Supreme Court there allowed them to stay on the ballot. And then I think you saw some of the national um, money come in, largely foundation money or kind of good government money. Um, you know, but in a lot of these places, I mean, in Idaho, Reclaim Idaho starts with, you know, 1400 bucks as they, as they invest in an RV. Um, and they and they um, and they start driving. You know, I mean, Florida. Um, Florida is a very sophisticated operation. Um, it had been going on for, for many many years. Um, the Brennan Center, ACLU involved. I mean, the, the, but I mean also the um, a Koch brothers come in with a lot of funding there, um, and the messaging uh, discipline and the polling groups that they did in Florida were really out of this world. It was, it was um, uh, you know, the reason I think in many ways they were able to win is they, they did not talk about this in racial justice frames at all. They explicitly kept that far out of the frame and they talked about second chances um, and eligibility for second chances for people who had you know, completed their sentences. Um, they did not talk about how this was, you know, a Jim Crow era abomination that had to be fixed uh, because that I think they worried would make it partisan. Um, so, so some of these groups certainly had sophisticated operations. Uh, others are just, are just um, you know, citizen groups that, you know, got moving and found each other. Yeah, it strikes me that um, that it's a bit of a tightrope. Um, on the one hand, fighting for structural reform. On the other hand, bringing it to people's lives without making it into a partisan food fight. Uh, I've got some questions here um, that are relevant to this. Uh, actually, quite a lot of questions. So maybe I'll turn to those. I but I do have to interject. It was if you were riding around Idaho in a fourteen hundred dollar RV. I am so glad you made it to finish this book. I, I, I mean, that just seems like a real uh, bargain, let's say, for an RV. Like, I just, it just feels like it might be a little dangerous, but you know. Uh, this, I, thing, this thing teetered. Um, Idaho has speed limits about 75, 80 miles an hour. This thing topped out about 55. Idaho has speed limits? Uh, it does. They're just very, very high. So, let me go to some of these questions. I've got some uh, on Twitter uh, under the hashtag fixing bugs and democracy and also in the Zoom Q&A. Uh, let's see. So let's see. There's some pretty good questions here. Let's continue this for a little bit. Kaya, wants, uh, Kaya writes in, 
and says, hi, David, love your books. I was really glad to see Slay the Dragon start by connecting the dots between the environmental justice crisis in Flint, Michigan and gerrymandering. She says, I feel like a lot of people don't understand that the fight to end gerrymandering is directly related to the fight for social justice. How is we, can we as a movement do a better job of helping folks understand the significance? So should one? How does one? It's a great question. I mean, um, gerrymandered legislatures are able to take actions that um, they're able to push extreme agendas and citizens can't do anything to stop them. Um, often times, you know, and I think what Slay the Dragon does so well is it tells the story of Flint um, and the emergency manager law there. And citizens in Michigan voted to repeal the emergency manager provision. Michigan's gerrymandered legislature, six weeks later, ignored the will of the people and just put it back into place. Um, and that allowed um, the legislature to re replace the, the, the uh, local elected officials in Flint to bring in a manager who switched the uh, water supply over to the uh, Flint River and you know launches a Legionnaire's disease crisis. Um, it's the gerrymandered legislature in Wisconsin that forced voters to the polls in person during a pandemic. It's gerrymandered legislatures across um, Michigan and Ohio and Wisconsin that have gone to war on, uh, on public universities um, and the labor movement. Um, and if you look at what's happened on voting rights over the course of this decade as well, in many ways, the first thing gerrymandered legislatures do is they, they enact voter ID laws and they close precincts and work on voter roll purges and make it harder to do early voting or, or voter registration. Um, now, this makes me sound like a partisan, um, but what has happened when these legislatures are beyond the reach of the people is that they're able to take actions that place them further beyond the reach of people. Um, and that is what I think we have to do a better job of explaining. I mean, gerrymandering is cheating. You know, it cheats people out of fair elections. It cheats people out of accountable representation. And it's not about which side wins. It's about whether or not a majority of Americans are able to translate themselves into a majority of seats or whether there's been some kind of you know enduring minority rule enacted um, and I think we have to we have to be aware of what the partisan consequences are without seeing it through a partisan lens if that makes sense. Now that feedback loop of legislators keeping themselves in power so these initiatives have the potential to change that but those legislatures are still there. So Zach, who's a, a student here at Princeton, uh, Zach, I think he's in Kentucky right now. You know, all the students have gone home. So I believe Zach's in Kentucky. Zach wants to know about uh, the interaction between legislatures and these reforms. And Zach says, if 2018 was a year of progress on key ballot initiatives, like uh, Amendment 4 in Florida, restoring felon voting rights, like the Medicaid expansion, how would you respond to these rollback attempts by Republican state legislatures on these issues? Uh, and I'll throw in, uh, Missouri redistricting reform, Utah re redistricting reform. Those legislatures were elected, uh, albeit gerrymandered. They're still in office. So now there's this battle. So, so talk about that a little bit. But it's a battle. The fight is on. It's been engaged. Um, and Between voters and their legislators. Yeah, it's amazing, right? I mean, yes, this is, uh, in many ways, this is a war between voters and their elected representatives. Um, let me back up though, uh, because Zach asks a great question. And it's a question that I struggle with in the last chapter of the book because I was trying to paint all of these, I was trying to tell the stories of these amazing victories. And as I'm finishing the book, the gerrymandered legislatures that I had written about in the first book kept unwinding all of these wins. And I'm like, wait, stop, just let me finish. Um, and they didn't offer me that respect. Thanks a lot, Florida. Um, and 
here's what I would say. I mean, Idaho goes ahead and they enact some work restrictions on Medicaid. So instead of 70,000 people getting it, you probably got 52 to 55,000. Uh, Florida, instead of 1.4 million people, the restrictions that the legislature placed on it um, will allow between three and 600,000 people to get their voting rights back. And the rest- but haven't the courts put a stop to that? No, actually, uh, well- It's a back and forth. I mean, I thought the courts- it's, had a back, it, it's a constant back and forth. And the last ruling was positive for the reformers, it's probably going to end up at the U.S. Supreme Court ultimately. Uh, but there's been progress made on all of these things. If we want to focus on the half step backwards in all of these states, we can. But there's also been a couple of steps ahead. And the, his, the, 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 the history of voting rights in this country is not a straight line towards progress. The history of voting rights did not immediately become over um, with the passage of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Um, you know, if it was a straight line, those amendments would have cured a lot of this, right? If, if it was a straight line, then the passage of the Voting Rights Act, it would have fixed a lot of these problems. It's not. It's a story of progress and retrenchment, sometimes all at once. And what's important is that I mean, Dr. King talked about the moral arc of the universe being long, but bending towards justice. And it doesn't bend towards justice by itself. Right, you gotta bend it. It only so, bends when all of us grab it. And what happened in 2018 is that people grabbed it. I, I, I just that, jump in on that one point, because uh, I often hear that. Uh, if, if or, and, and Sam, this is for you as much for both of you. I have my answer, but I'm curious of yours. If gerrymandering uh, is so powerful, if it locks in, preferences so much, then you hit 2018 or you hit other elections like that when it's broken by electoral mobilization to some extent. That's how people feel. Why invest in the structural reform as opposed to winning elections, party reform, and, and kind of mobilizing for these kinds of waves? Because it wasn't broken in 2018. You don't, you don't want to wait for a wave of public opinion. Like 2008, it sounds great to say, wow, we were inspired and we voted for Barack Obama. What happened in 2008 was there was this recession that took down the American economy and sent us into this place where we would rather not be. And for elections to only be responsive to voters when voters are so in such desperate straits. I mean, what is like, do we have to wait for a worldwide depression to, to get change of government? I think the, the key here is building a governmental system that's responsive to voter to voters changing under normal circumstances. I so think that's you know, exactly it's like, right. Yeah, like, it's like I mean, the, I, this levy that gets built up. All right. What I would add, though, is yeah. that 2018 did not defeat gerrymandering. Democrats might have taken back control of Congress in 2018. They did so by threading a really difficult needle by winning the three quarters of the seats that uh, flipped in, in 2018 were drawn by commissions and courts. Um, they were able to win in 2018 after Pennsylvania enacts a new map that turns a 13-5 gerrymandered map into a fair map, after Florida and uh, Virginia uh, do mid-decade uh, redraws. But Democrats made very little gains in any of the states that were the most excessively partisan gerrymandered. They didn't take back a single seat in Ohio. They didn't take back a single seat in Wisconsin. They didn't take back a single seat in North Carolina. All of those states stayed exactly the same, not only in Congress, but also in their state legislatures. And this is especially clear if you look at Wisconsin, uh, where in all the statewide races, um, US Senate, governor, all, you know, uh, Attorney General, Treasurer, all of the, all of those offices go for the Democrats in 2018, De and voters give 190,000 more votes statewide to Democrats for the Assembly, and Democrats are able to flip exactly one seat, at cutting a majority to 63-36. It's even a wave is not enough against uh, these maps. I think it's a real misnomer if we think that Democrats defeated gerrymandering because a blue wave tipped Congress in their direction in 2018. This remains a huge problem, not only nationally in Congress, but in state legislatures around the country that are wildly unrepresentative on maps that are completely not responsive to voters. 
Let me connect the dots there for, and then turn back to one of the listener questions, uh, or I guess viewer questions. So I think uh, broadly speaking, there's a tendency that's kind of baked into uh, how progressives and liberals think, uh, especially if they understand history, um, that national reform can change democracy, that Dr. King led a national movement, that national opinion, a wave of opinion can sweep one party into power or can sweep the other party into power. So that's a theory of, uh, of change that really comes naturally, I think, to liberals. Um, but really, I think a lot of what we're talking about in Unrigged is discovering your inner federalist, finding ways to make state government more responsive. And I want to turn to, um, uh, and what that means is that one needs to take a more granular view. And, I, and Abe and Pat, uh, a little while ago, asked a question that perhaps um, uh, on that note, uh, Dave, they ask, uh, are there signs of hope in particular states? And they want to know about state courts. And they are curious about exactly what kinds of things you see in state courts. And I think the implication is it's about redistricting. Um, I mean, state courts are now the only game in town now that the Supreme Court has been declared um, a partisan, a gerrymandering non justiciable, um, which is not necessarily bad news because uh, state courts and state constitutions often have far more robust protections of, of voting rights and the right to vote than the US Constitution, which doesn't really mention it at all. Um, so Every what we've seen in Pennsylvania in 2018 and then again in North Carolina, yeah. Um, um, so, so in Pennsylvania in 2018 and then in North Carolina in 2019, you had state courts that overturned uh, unconstitutionally gerrymandered maps um, and imposed new maps. And we, you did not see any additional litigation on that front. I imagine it's, it's too late in the cycle and litigation is expensive and people decided not to push it. But the, the playing field in 2021 for the next set of maps is going to be in state courts um, I mean, I think it would be better if we had a, a federal national standard on this and we didn't have to have litigation in 50 states. And as we have seen, um, you know, some of those states have, you know, deeply partisan as Supreme Courts. So then you end up with all of these, uh, and then you end up with funneling a lot of money into state court races as proxies for redistricting fights and that's well, like last week's Wisconsin Supreme Court race right that was yes heavily funded hotly contested in the end the liberal one uh I think in part because it was at the same time as the Democratic primary that's right but I mean also Pennsylvania I mean I mean Pennsylvania was only able to win that map because Democrats in the state invested millions of dollars in 2015 in fighting to take back the state's Supreme Court uh they put their own sympathizers on that court and and won a ruling that I think was right. But um, you know, it came it came because the Democrats spent you know eight figures on state Supreme Court races in Pennsylvania in 2015. Judy, um, listener Judy, uh, wants to know about a specific state. She wants to know about Texas. Her general question is, what do you do about a state that doesn't have the initiative process to put a question on the ballot? Uh, and I think this gets in, uh, why don't we just do specifically Texas? What, is there hope? Or are they doomed? Um, Texas, yeah, I mean, maybe. <laughs> um, They've got racial gerrymandering lawsuits, right? Like that, uh, that is a route for Texas. Um, I mean, I'd say this. I'd say Texas at the beginning of this, of this decade was... 10149 in its state house, and it's now down to I think eight seats. Uh, so a, a huge advantage is is now down to about eight seats. Y you get fairer maps in states when both sides have a seat at the table, and you often get fairer maps when both parties are afraid that the other side could win a seat at the table, so they are willing to sort of negotiate and make a deal. Um, so in Texas, it, it, your best bet is probably the Democrats are somehow able to take back a chamber, earn a seat at the table, and then you get something closer to fair. Well, there's three. But it's not going to yeah. be good. There's multiple states like that. Texas, yeah. nine seats, or I think you're right, eight seats flips that Texas House. In Florida, flipping nine seats flips the House of Representatives. In Kansas, flipping one legislative seat 
breaks the veto proof majority. Uh, and so therefore they have to work with the governor. And so I think there's, uh, there seems in some states, it seems like just brute force is the, is the answer. Uh, yeah. Sandra, Sandra Cosgrove writes, she's the president of the League of Women Voters in Nevada. And she says, well, what do you think of Eric Holder's um, elect more Democrat strategy? So she's, uh, so Sandra is uh, essentially conceding the partisan point. And she says, how about just electing more Democrats or should we get more independent redistricting commissions? Yes. Yes, I think we could get yes. more independent redistricting commissions, but I think the political reality is that the only way to the only way to force progress at the political level, if you don't have an initiative, is to have both sides have yeah. a seat at the table. But it strikes me that there's two questions here. It's not just power between Democrats and Republicans. It's building districts that are responsive to make right. everybody responsive, and that and that's really what I'm talking place about. Where independent commissions have no substitute because because you to just break that loop and make it not about d's versus r's but exactly. make it about voters and their electives i don't I, I mean i'm not wishing for democrats to take back the house in texas because i'm i'm a partisan i would like to see a process that creates a fair map that is responsive to voters i think that that's the essence of um majority rule um, the problem is in all of these states right now and, uh, that the only way forward is often going to be through politics. Um, and that, is, that means that this becomes partisan in some ways. Um, it's inevitable and it's frustrating uh, and it could be the un raveling of reform, but there's no other, there's no other way to do it in many places. Do you think, and we talked about this with Fahey last week, but now you have a sample of, of many activists. We're in a pandemic, as, as you've heard, things are shut down, we're living a virtual world. Uh, the kinds of activism that is always central and was in her case, going out, signing things, knocking on doors, for the foreseeable future, uh, that might not happen. And um, she was very optimistic still, um, but I'm curious from your journalistic perspective, what kind of impact can this possibly have, even if it goes on in some variation for a while on this movement that you've traced? I admire Katie's optimism. Um, I don't always see it myself. Uh, I wish I could, um, but I mean, I, I know that there have been anti-gerrymandering efforts that were going to be on the ballot this year in Arkansas, Oklahoma, um, and Oregon, uh, all of which are in some state of disarray at this point. There's a lot of ballot initiatives that are having a real hard time collecting signatures, let alone doing the work of door knocking. It's going to be really, really hard. Um, what we're going to need to do, um, you know, maybe there's questions on this too, is we have to rethink our voting model uh, ahead of the fall. We clearly need to move towards a vote by mail. We don't know what this pandemic is going to look like in the fall. What we do know is that in-person voting is going to be extraordinarily difficult. In, in over seventy days, over seventy percent of votes in Wisconsin last week were cast by mail. Yeah. So that was actually, despite all the stink, if you if for nerds who followed that closely. A lot of focus was on courts and how courts were so annoying and made the election happen. A state court made the election happen. The Supreme Court said you had to count the votes in a fairly restrictive way. And in the end, 71% of people voted by mail. It was actually record turnout for a one, for an election where there was only one primary contested. Uh, I think at some level, I, it looks like when properly mobilized, voters can get pretty riled up about, uh, about their right to vote. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, but the question is, are we ready for vote by mail to go from 10 or 12 percent up to 70 percent? And no, states aren't ready for this. They're not ready to print So Wisconsin those. was lucky. They're not so, ready to print these ballots. They're not ready to... Uh, Dave, it's a little like your 2010 story where, <laughs> I mean, one party has seen what's gonna, about to come, the GOP, in terms of lowering turnout. And it's not clear to me the other party is saying this is a priority right now. Uh, they should make it a priority. Yeah. Yeah. What about, so just following up on that point, we've got a couple of questions from listeners. Dela from, I believe, uh, Virginia wants to know about how coronavirus will affect, uh, you, you may even know Dela, 
I think um, I do. Yeah, I think you probably do. Um, uh, I wouldn't go so far as to call this the usual suspects, but I know a few of the names on the question thread. Uh, but wants to know about um, COVID and the census delay impacting redistricting and politics. Uh, Judy has a similar question. What about uh, how, this is sort of getting into the weeds a tiny bit, but uh, we've talked about voting and coronavirus and, and what that means for democracy. What about the census? It's gonna make it really hard for census goers to, for, to go door to door and, and count people. And if you don't have an accurate count, you, um, you have a lot of problems, um, whether it's uh, funding formulas, whether it's apportionment in, in an accurate way, which then affects the electoral college count, and then it's redistricting for all these states, especially Virginia and um, New, and New Jersey. Jersey, states that have odd year elections. Right. Boy, I mean, if you start yeah. pushing this back three, four months, um, you run into a lot of trouble. Aaron and my staff was looking at the rules, and as far as we can tell, it's not possible to have an election on time in New Jersey in November. And the only way it can happen is to either postpone the November election by weeks or a, a month or to, um, uh, or to use estimated populations to draw lines. Like the, like listen, if Democrats were thinking about this in a sophisticated, serious way right now, they would be saying, okay, because Congress has to sign off on, on, on changes to the census deadlines, they would be saying, we will sign off on this, but you can't use citizen voting age population to uh, draw state legislatures. Well, so... Oh, that's interesting. So it is true that populations at the state legislative level don't have to be exactly the same number of people. So there is, and, and it's actually true of congressional now uh, due to a West Virginia case. So you can imagine maybe doing it based on estimated populations. Like that would be one way through. It, it wouldn't be ideal. Um, so um, let's see. So back to these questions here. I'm just looking. We've actually got some pretty good questions. If people want to ask questions, it's possible to ask on the Zoom Q&A on Twitter with the hashtag fixing bugs and democracy. And finally, by texting to 929-242-9349. And, uh, and I wanna go back here. There's some kind of interesting questions here. Um, wow. So here's one from Jennifer, who, uh, who I believe is from North Carolina. And she wants to know, what do you think about the reform process and the outcome in Virginia? So what's your snapshot of what's going on there uh, in Virginia? Um, the reform process in Virginia is really interesting. Um, I, let's see, I would say this. Um, it's an imperfect compromise, but it's a compromise that Democrats and Republicans both signed on to. Um, and in many ways, it's the best the political deal that could have been gotten um, by Democrats and Republicans sitting down together. Legislators in Virginia gave up more power over this voluntarily than any other state in the nation ever has. Yeah, um, what they were afraid. It's a start. You know, it's a, it's a start. It's not perfect. Um, and then you had a lot of Democrats who didn't want to follow up on it once they took complete control down there. Um, and that would have been a disaster for reform. Whether or not you think that that's a perfect reform, it's the one that both parties signed on to, it's the one that they campaigned on, and had Democrats in Virginia walked away from that reform and said, we're going to go ahead and use our tri trifecta power and play constitutional hardball and ram this down the other side's throat, uh, it would have been a disaster and set back the reform movement and, and overly politicized it um, and given, you know, Scott Walker and his side all the ammunition that they needed to say that uh, Democrats are just talking out of both sides of their mouth on this. But it is going to the ballot in November. And so they eventually, after thinking about some alternatives, did the right thing. It passed. Well, uh, it passed because 45 Republicans and eight Democrats moved it out of the House. Uh, so uh, it passed in the Senate overwhelmingly, bipartisanly, uh, and the House in Virginia almost stopped it. I, uh, you know, I... but. Good. Those, God bless them, those eight Democrats. I mean, I guess like, like one of them was... Um, I, I, I have a lot of respect for their courage. Van Valkenburg and, yes. uh, and, and seven others, I believe. So, hey, by the way, I just wanted to mention that you were saying bad things about the census and how that's going to screw things up, but I wanted to, I, I can always find something positive. With unemployment through the roof, there's people who are available to be census takers. And so if we can just get out of this dark, dark tunnel we're in, there's gonna be a bunch of people who, you know, I wish had jobs, 
uh, but it turns out that they can get jobs as census takers. And so you guys get, get out there to like whatever, mycensus2020.gov, fill out your census form, poke around the website, get a job taking a census in your community. So I, I, think, uh, I think there's uh, ways forward. Hey, listen, we're a little short on time here. We're kind of winding down to the end. Um, but Dave, um, my last question for you is, uh, we're, uh, as you're going around talking about this terrific book, Unrigged, um, and you're talking about democracy reform nationwide, as you go around, what are you watching for uh, this summer and we, as we go into the fall? What, are, what things around the country are you keeping an eye on uh, as you uh, think of things that couldn't quite make it into the book? To me, the pandemic has changed all of this. And the question of voting rights is only going to become more crucial over these next few months. We've got about 200 days before the presidential election. We need to be certain that every American is able to vote freely, fairly, safely, and securely. And that means really ramping up vote by mail, which is not an easy thing to do. It's not a flip. It's not a switch you can flip. It is a, a process that has to be done thoughtfully and carefully and it has to be funded. And there's a patchwork of state laws around the country that are, are governing this. And what we already see right now is that, you know, many states are trying to slow it down and you've, it's being pushed into partisan politics and, and not being funded properly. Uh, you've got some states that are saying that a pandemic is, is, is not enough of an excuse to vote absentee. You've got states that want to make you request a ballot and give you sort of an additional step to go through rather than simply mailing you a ballot. Uh, there are laws in a lot of states that it, it need to be addressed if 70% um, of, the, uh, of the votes coming in are by mail then the election officials have to be able to start counting those a little bit earlier uh, or else, you know, in Pennsylvania and Michigan, you know, two states uh, that have dramatically expanded vote by mail, but they say the clerks can't start counting until election day. Imagine if that's the case for, you know, 70% of the ballots, we might not have results for days. And then you're going to have a lot of, uh, you know, talk about voter fraud as the numbers change. It's going to call all of this into question. We've got to have a way to, see ourselves to a nonpartisan conversation about how we safeguard an election during a pandemic. But, you know, Wisconsin, again, got uh, got a jump. And one of the things they did is they waited until a week after the election to announce results. And I got to say, that really took the pressure off. I found it kind of relaxing, honestly. But I agree with you. Um, that's a good point about vote by mail and finding ways to secure the vote. It feels like uh, that's going to be right up front uh, as we roll into November. All right. Well, uh, we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, I just want to say that it's been a, a real pleasure to have Dave Daly on talking about his new book, Unrigged, uh, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy. And this is a, a really interesting book. I highly recommend it. It's sort of a, you know, you, you don't think of democracy reform, reform this way, but it's a rollicking tour through all the different ways that democracy is being uh, reformed around the country. Uh, and so Dave has been uh, very good at about joining us. Um, and uh, you can... Uh, and this has been part of Fixing Bugs in Democracy, a series done by the Princeton Gerrymandering Project and by the Pace Center for Civic Engagement here at Princeton University. It's also an episode of Politics and Polls, and uh, Politics and Polls uh, is a podcast of the Woodrow Wilson School, um, and it's uh, available on, let's see, Jillian, you got to help me here, Stitcher. iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, and our website, politicspolls.princeton.edu. Yep. Thank you. Very, very well done. And, and, uh, school and, and people can also uh, find us. Um, I'm on Twitter as Sam Wang, PhD. I'm and Adam Zelizer. Julian Zelizer. Yeah. Okay. So we're, uh, we're reachable. Anyway, um, so um, Dave, thanks again. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks to everybody. Uh, thanks for all these great questions. Uh, I'm Dave Daly 3 on Twitter. If uh, we didn't get to your questions, find me up there and, uh, you know, until I get my job as a census taker, I'm around and can answer all your questions. <laughs> Free copy of Unrigged with your <laughs> census form. No, 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 no. Discounted, 20% off. Thanks, everybody. That was a lot of fun. All right, take care. Bye-bye.